that uh, the recession, the Great Recession, the worst uh, recession since they don't the need to also ensure life, about it. life should be off the table. They talked endlessly about it, and their agenda was rejected by the American people. That's a simple fact. Because fashion. they're stupid. Thank so many, you're many people in this room who are critical to crafting and co coaxing the bold health care initiative that I'm about to sign. There are a lot of parents to this initiative, as you know. I'm going to mention a few by name and just a tiny part of their contributions. Senator Kennedy, together we pitched the secretaries on our vision to ensure all our citizens and on the need for federal support to make the vision real. His work in Washington and behind the scenes on Beacon Hill was absolutely essential. It's now my pleasure to introduce my collaborator and friend, Senator Edward Kennedy. Senator? Thank you. But you're officially not a libertarian anymore, right? I mean, like, this position well, is, runs so far from the libertarian position. Is this so you admit that you have more of a you know, European socialist leaning uh, perspective on this issue. Why is that funny? I'm, I'm not afraid. It's not. Right. I'm not afraid to say European socialism well, under, works. Right, but <laughs> not wanting to overtax Repeat myself. Very briefly, some of the points I made then, but updated to this new decade. The Blum Center and the work it does around the world, the work my foundation does in America and around the world, reflect two of the most hopeful developments of the early 21st century. First is the rise of what I would call communitarianism, not necessarily a more left-wing philosophy, but a more embracing one, the idea that we are in an interdependent world and we will either make a community of shared opportunities and shared responsibilities or we will pay the price because we're interdependent. Divorce is not an option. What we do affects others. What others do affects us. There is a deeper understanding of this, I think, than ever before. Every nation in every region now has a decision to make. Either you are with us or you are with the terrorists. Look, I was an independent during the time of Reagan-Bush. I'm not trying to return to Reagan-Bush. My positions don't talk about the, things that you suggest they talk about. The recession, the Great Recession, the worst uh, recession. He's your party. Here's what I think. Here's what I think. I don't think the election is going to be decided on evolution. I think the election is going to be decided on a fundamental question that the American people are going to ask themselves, and they're going to ask themselves whether or not they're better off today than they were three or sure, four well, years ago. Sure, well, that's a good question. And they're going to answer. And they're going to answer the, the issue, question. You win. No. If that's the well, issue you want, and that's if it's just the uh, conditions. Well, a lot of hands going up, Mr. President. Want to pick someone? Yeah, well, uh, you know, they, they, you, put, you, you kind of put me on the spot here. That, that, uh, the guy in the glass is right back in the, <laughs> right in the back here. Why not? Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I don't have a job, but that's because I've been lucky enough to live in Silicon Valley uh, for a while. And... Uh, work for a small startup down the, down the street here that did quite well. So I'm unemployed by choice. My question is, would you please raise my taxes? I don't want to answer that question. That's a clown question, bro. <laughs> if, we, if we discovered that uh, you know, space aliens were planning to attack and we needed a, a massive buildup to counter the, the space alien threat um, and really inflation and budget deficits took secondary uh, place to that. Um, this slump would be over in 18 months. And then if we discovered, whoops, we made a mistake. There aren't actually any space So we need aliens. Orson Welles be better... is what you're saying. No, that's a, that's a, there was a Twilight Zone episode like this in which uh, scientists fake an uh, alien threat in order to achieve world peace. Well, this kind, we don't need it. We need it in order to get... Well, see, we don't really have a free market. We don't have free enterprise in this country. As much as they say that we do, um, you know, these, these people, these wealthy, these corporations, they don't really like competition. They don't like us having a choice. They like monopolies, yeah. you know? Their nirvana is if they were the only car company or the only airline. Um, and 
it's odd, isn't it, that these people who say they believe so much in our way of life actually believe in a system where they don't want us to have a choice. They actually they admire the old Soviet way. If you only need one car company, if you only need one newspaper, you know, I mean... We economic hitmen really have been the ones responsible for creating this first truly global empire. And we work many different ways. But perhaps the most common is that we will identify a, a country that has resources our corporations covet, like oil, and then arrange a huge loan to that country from the World Bank or one of its sister organizations. But the money never actually goes to the country. Instead, it goes to our big corporations to build infrastructure projects in that country, power plants, industrial parks, ports, things that benefit a few rich people in that country, in addition to our corporations, but really don't help the majority of the people at all. However, those people, the whole country is left holding a huge debt. It's such a big debt they can't repay it, and that's part of the plan that they can't repay it. And so at some point, we economic hitmen go back to them and say, listen, you lost a lot of money, can't pay your debt, so sell your oil, real cheap to our oil companies. Allow us to build a military base in your country or send troops in support of ours to some place in the world like Iraq or vote with us on the next UN vote to have their electric utility company privatized and their water and sewage system privatized and sold to U.S. corporations or other multinational corporations. So there was that whole mushrooming thing and it's so typical of the way the IMF and the World Bank work. They put a country in debt, and it's such a big debt it can't pay it, and then you offer to refinance that debt and, and, and pay even more interest. And you demand this quid pro quo, which you call a conditionality or good governance, which means basically that they've got to sell off their resources, in, in, including many of their social services, their utility companies, their school systems sometimes, their, their, their penal systems, their insurance systems, to foreign corporations. So it's a, it's a double, triple, quadruple whammy. Questions? So when it comes to push tax cuts, uh, now that Congress is divided, why, why didn't Senate Democrats push through this bill back when you control the Senate, the House, and the President? The tax cuts weren't about to expire then, so that's why we're doing it now. Foreseeing this issue, two years after it expired at the end of 2010. And that's why they were extended one year. But why didn't, why didn't they vote when you could have pushed this bill through and had it signed in the law? Next question. I appreciate the tenor of the conversations. Uh, I think it will actually yield results uh, before the end of the year, and I look forward to continuing this dialogue in the months ahead. Thank you very much, everybody. The recession, the Great Recession, the worst uh, recession since Let's the Great Depression. A couple of things here. On January the 4th of this year, the UN was about to release a report which actually was praising Gaddafi as a model uh, leader in the Arab world. And, you know, let, let's just also recognize one remarkable piece of, um, of coincidence. All of the countries that are tagged by the mainstream media on behalf of the, uh, the political elite, all of the countries tagged, such as Venezuela, Cuba, Libya, Iraq, Iran, North Korea, all have one thing in common, or had one thing in common, and that is they are free of debt from the World Bank. That they are not locked into the World Bank and the IMF. They have their own banks, they issue their own currency. And, and we also have to uh, recognize the, the remarkable coincidence between Gaddafi's statement that he was going to start issuing uh, gold dinar and demanding that his oil was purchased in gold. And then the next thing we know, of course, then we have a popular uprising. Uh, buenas tardes, good afternoon. I'm Diego Sánchez de la Cruz. I'm an analyst at uh, Libertad Digital, Libre Mercado, a free market uh, online newspaper here in Spain. I have two questions. One is for uh, Professor Schwarz, one is for Professor Krogman. Uh, the one for Professor Krogman, there, there was an article back in the year 2002 when you urged the Federal Reserve to create a housing bubble to replace the, um, te high, the tech bubble, the, the, the Nasdaq bubble. Uh, looking back into what you wrote 10 years ago, this is the 10 year anniversary of your prescription, and uh, we've seen that both the US and, and our country have really suffered from the active promotion of this uh, housing bubble that was active not just from a monetary policy perspective, but also from a political perspective, as we've seen here with the savings banks, 
or we've seen in the United States with semi-public institutions and the guidance given to Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. Besides this, I would like to ask to Professor uh, Schwartz and also to Professor Krugman, being his, uh, done some of his best work in the area of commerce, about the issues of protectionism today and what uh, they represent, what challenges they may represent to coming out of this crisis, given the fact that in the, thir in the, in the 30s, in the decade of the 30s, which is a decade that Professor Krugman is talking about a lot lately, uh, the Smooth Hardly Act and many other tariff barriers had a lot to do with the creation of a global economic downturn. Thank you. Okay, um, so on, on, the, on the first one, uh, I think the, if I may say, for Christ's sake, give me a break. Uh, <laughs> if you actually read that article, I actually read it, I was joking. I was saying that I was talking about the difficulty of responding uh, purely with monetary policy to the, to the kind of slump we were then expressing. Yeah, you make the point, uh, interest is the cost of money. And you made the point that if, if um, in, in some of your writings, that if the, 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 it should have self-corrected if there were demand because people wanted to buy the houses, interest rates should have naturally should have gone up. Should have gone and then up. speculation in real estate would have died down. People would have said, "Well, it's not such a great investment right. to go into real estate because they, you know, the, it's too expensive to borrow." Mm -hmm. So, in other words, the bottom line of it is the Austrians would say there was a lot of intervention in the economy, um, both from the government proper and from the central bank, making particular types of investments seem artificially attractive. And so when Greenspan did this, instead of letting us have that moderate recession and allowing everything to be cleared out, we start all over again without all these entrepreneurial errors, he locks the errors in. He encourages people to persist, to carry on in what they've been doing, so that when the crash came, it was all the worse. So now that we have a kind of grasp on you know, who were the actors that really made this crisis uh, so severe, then that helps figure out what should be done. And the first answer, Austrian answer, would be the opposite of the, a lot of the mainstream answers. Their answer would be pump more money in and force lower interest rates. And the Austrian answer is, but if the lower interest rates cause the problem, how could they be the solution? We want to stop doing that because these things are diverting resources into the wrong channels. We don't want additional government stimulus in the form of more borrowing and spending because that siphons resources from the private sector and allocates them toward economically arbitrary projects. The private sector is starved for capital. It, you can't keep doing that to the private sector. Uh, basically what we want to do is see the opposite done, is have as much turned back over into the hands of the private sector as possible so that private entrepreneurs using the price system can help us recover. Because sometimes people say, you Austrians think we shouldn't do anything. But it depends on who's we. They shouldn't do anything, the politicians, but we have a lot of work to do. Entrepreneurs have to figure out which sectors of the economy are bubble sectors that need to be reduced and which are sectors that have been starved for resources and need to be expanded. And there's no non-arbitrary way for a politician to know that. Only an entrepreneur risking his own capital, uh, responding to prices, can know what needs to be done. That's what needs to occur right now. Okay. Now, um, I'm glad that Ambassador... I, can I jump in here? Because, sure. again, the clock is ticking, and that right. leads to the to a question about this monstrous federal deficit. Mm -hmm. Is it a problem? Is it a threat to the future of America's uh, children, or, or is it not a problem? Senator Obama? I think it's an enormous problem. And what are you going to do okay. specifically to cut it or to raise, uh, either to stop spending or to uh, raise revenues? I think it is an enormous problem. Uh, this has been the most fiscally irresponsible administration uh, in certainly my memory. Uh, we have gone from trillion-dollar surpluses to trillion-dollar deficits in the blink of an eye. Not all of those costs uh, are the fault of the administration. Obviously, 9-11 occurred uh, and uh, the decline in the economy. Uh, but what is also true is that uh, it was aided and abetted uh, by a set of fiscal policies that I think uh, were uh, on the wrong course. We can take a look example of, of yesterday's vote. And to my Republican friends, I would suggest, uh, I, I think this is a good agreement because I know that they're swallowing some things that they don't like as well. And I'm looking forward to seeing them uh, on the field of competition uh, over the next two years. Thanks very much, everybody.